Peace be with you. Let's, uh, let's find our seats. Good morning. We're going to be in Psalm 13 today. My name is Brian. I'm one of the pastors here. This summer we're in a sermon series on the Psalms. And as Pastor Dan laid out in the introduction from Psalms 1 and 2, Last week, the Psalms are best seen as, as woven together, this poetic commentary on, on the hope of Israel as seen through the time of the kings of Israel. So the characters we see in the Psalms are the Lord God, maker of heaven and earth, the blessed man, the anointed son, the king who's trusting in the Lord, and the righteous, all those who are taking refuge in the blessed man, the anointed son, the king. The other character is the wicked, the enemy, who has burst off the bonds of the Lord. They're living how they want to live in life. And so we're reading the Psalms in that context, context as they flow from 1 to 115, following the hope that the righteous have in the blessed king, trusting in the Lord. The Israelites, they had individual lives that went up and down, but their ultimate hope was communally set on the king. As he goes, they go. If he falters, the nation falters. If he prevails, they all prevail. Like David fighting Goliath, one man represents them all. Weak king versus giant enemy. David is the champion. If he wins, the nation wins. I know that's slightly foreign to us, but that's the context we're entering in the Psalms. See, the Psalms are like a huge, beautiful tapestry painting a story for us. Imagine it spanning on this wall, and it goes all the way around the sanctuary. It's a huge story, and it's knit together with each individual psalm. They aren't just individual journal entries scattered on a table that we can pick up and compare with our lives. If we try to grab one psalm, we have to take scissors and cut it out of the tapestry. So instead of that, let's leave it right there and gently tug on the threads in Psalm 13 and see where they pop up elsewhere. I believe that there is deep meaning for us here in Psalm 13. For us, individually, members of Christ, his beloved body and bride, there's deep meaning for us here when we take this approach. So let's stand together now for the reading of God's holy word. To the choir master, A psalm of David. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long? Shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Bountiful Lord, the unfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. We open our mouths and pant because we long for your commandments. Turn to us and be gracious to us, as is your way with those who love your name. As we preach and receive this word, not our will, but yours be done. Light our eyes, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Looking at Psalm 13. In the context that when enemy, when enmity is strong and God seems gone, the word of the Lord lets hope live on and sorrow-filled longing 
in sleep-defying prayer, in Scripture-ripened singing. Starting out first, verses 1 and 2, in sorrow-filled longing, David cries out to the God, to the Lord, how long? When is the end date? Where is the finish line? And then for these things, and he lays out complaints about God, about his personal self, and then the enemy. But I actually think we can understand best what's going on in David's soul when we see him as sandwiched in between the exalted enemy and the absence of the Lord. So we're going to look at it in that order. First, God, he cries out to God, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? And this forgetting and this hiding face, it's covenant language. It's surrounding God's promises to bless Israel and dwell with them in the land that he gave earlier. Consider Deuteronomy 4.31. It says, for the Lord your God is a compassionate God. He will not abandon nor destroy you nor forget the covenant with your fathers which he swore to them. Deuteronomy 31.18 says, but I will assuredly hide my face on that day because of all the evil that they will have done, for they will have turned away to other gods. See, this forgetting, it's not I forgot to text you back. It's forget you, I'm deleting your number out of my phone. It's God abandoning his covenant promise and treating David like he's gone astray. That's what David's saying. David is not giving poetic language to how he feels about what God should be doing. He's not making up some image of God, of what he wants God to be, and complaining that he's not getting it. He's not the child complaining that she didn't get a pony, and the parents are going, why did you think you were getting a pony? You had no reason to think that. We never said that. David has a sure foundation to believe that God will not forget him or hide his face. God has said so. We must know what God says about himself if we want to have any sense of true expectations for the life God has given us. If we are simply making up what we think God should be doing, we will, we will be in turmoil and we will be in angst, but that's not what's happening in Psalm 13. David knows what God says about himself, and he also knows what God says about the enemy. See, we know from Genesis 3 that, that the enemy comes in like a serpent and convinces Adam and Eve to not believe what God says about himself, but instead, like Psalm 2 says, to burst off the bonds that God has given for life and choose their own version. The enemy has now spread down through the ages, multiplied. It spreads to all people who just live their life as if God doesn't exist. Or if he does, they live as if God has no design for them. It's all people who just do what comes naturally, who do what they want to do. My will be done, not yours, the wicked cry. This is the mantra of the serpent in the garden. It's the enemy. David knows this. And in the Psalms leading up to 13, he's been carefully arranging and painting the picture of the enemy multiplying and chasing David, surrounding him. Indeed, the very last line of Psalm 12, right before Psalm 13, Psalm 12, 8, it says, On every side the wicked prowl, as vileness is exalted among the children of man. The enemy is exalted, enlarged, risen, above, multiplied to the point where David has nowhere left to run and he's starting to be concerned about God coming through because the enemy is attacking even what God says about himself. Look at Psalm 10, 10 and 11. The helpless are crushed, sink down, and fall by the enemy's might. The enemy, he's saying in his heart, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it, meaning the wicked things that the enemy's done. Remember, in Genesis 3, God has put enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And so David knows that he is the Lord's anointed king of Israel. There's going to be a line of offspring from this seed, and David is in it. He's the anointed king of Israel. God's promises are running through him. He's a type of savior king for God's people to deliver them. But at this point in time in his life, and in the story of God's people, as told in the Psalms, the seed of the woman, the blessed one, the anointed king, feels utterly overwhelmed by the enemy, by the seed of the serpent, and utterly abandoned by God. It's as if David is a tiny sprout on a hill. The seed has been planted, it's passed on, and, and two leaves are above the ground. The sun is out, and it's going to grow into the blessed tree in whom all the birds of the earth take refuge, but the sun has stopped shining. Shining. 
It's gone, and the two-leaf sprout knows it needs sunlight to grow, but making it worse, there's an invasive serpent plant that thrives in the darkness, and it's growing on not its terms, but God's, and it's spreading rapidly in the dark like a vine slithering up the hill. It's going to choke out the sprout of the seed of the woman unless the sunrise breaks through the darkness. That's what David is experiencing here, and he's starting to take counsel In his soul, God is gone. He has no one to give him advice or guide his path. He's placing plan after plan in front of himself saying, what am I going to do? If God is gone and the enemy is strong, what can I do? Should I try this? Should I try that? He's toiling in godless plans and he has sorrow in his heart all the day, making it worse. See, this word for sorrow among all the forms of anxiety and anguish is closest to, to grief. So let's consider the widow, the new widow She's not simply overwhelmed by funeral plans and financial decisions and future considerations. She is grieved in her heart because her beloved husband is gone. His smiling face is closed up in a coffin. David is not simply a plant that needs the sun to survive. He's a man after God's own heart. He loves the Lord, and the Lord is gone, so he feels sad. And he's not wrong to feel this way. See, sorrow is our experience, our God-given experience of, of loved things lost. Chip Dodd, Chip Dodd says this in his book, Sadness. Sadness is the feeling that speaks to how much you value what is missed, what is gone, and what is lost. Sadness is proportional. The more sadness you feel after a loss, the more you value what is lost. Sorrow is the God-given reflex to losing or missing something we value. If the doctor taps your knee, your leg bounces, and if the doctor takes the sucker or the sticker out of the child's hand, they will be sad and cry because they value it and they feel sad and they cry. It's natural. I want to spend a little more time here because while our children know this, I think something about growing up In this age, we've grown this aversion to the reflex of sadness. We see the doctor's hammer coming. We flex our whole leg, all of our muscles, so that our leg won't bounce. So look at this. Sorrow is not the enemy. Sorrow is in Psalm 13. The enemy is in Psalm 13. They're different. The enemy is the enemy. Sorrow is not the enemy. Sorrow might reveal that we value something more than God, or we might respond to it sinfully, but feeling sorrow is not the enemy in God's kingdom. But it does seem to be an enemy in the kingdom of of comfort, right? Of personal comfort, individual happiness. If my God is me, my will be done, not yours. If my God is me and my goal is comfort and happiness, then when sorrow or anything difficult or stressful arises, I have to get to work killing it, whether I get busy trying to desperately improve my circumstances Or by numbing myself with food or pornography or drugs or alcohol or screens or work or just busyness. I need to make sure I destroy. I don't feel sorrow and stress because in the kingdom of comfort, it is an enemy. But you, Christian, you have been delivered out of the domain of darkness, out of the other kingdoms. You've been transferred to the kingdom of the beloved son. So sorrow is not your enemy any longer. You don't need to fear it or fight it. You're in the kingdom of God where sorrow is a temporarily present natural reflex for those living in a time where God is good and his work isn't finished. Instead, we can feel sorrow and lament. Consider this as a a definition of lament. Lament is crying out to God When what we're experiencing in life doesn't line up with what God says in his word. Lament is what we do. It's crying out to God when what we're experiencing in this life doesn't line up with what God has said in his word. So we know what God says. We experience the sorrow of his absence in the pain of life and we cry out to him. That's what David does. Ecclesiastes, see, sorrow is not the enemy. Ecclesiastes tells us that sorrow is better than laughter and other things because because contrary to cheap laughter and unfounded feasting and sentimental songs of fools, sorrow is the grounded true experience of those wise enough to know who God says he is and honest enough to open their eyes 
and see if it's true yet. We see this in the New Testament. Well, Jesus, he came feasting, but he says there will be fasting and trouble for his followers when he leaves. In Acts 8, after the spirit is given, after the church has been built, Stephen is murdered, and we're told devout men with the spirit buried him and made great lamentation over him, over his loss. The New Testament is full of hopeful people, persevering saints, living out the victory of Jesus through suffering and sorrow as they wait for him to complete his work. It's full of it. And yet the apostle Paul, he knew that this was difficult. Many people were having a hard time grasping this. The Corinthians especially had a hard time accepting Paul as a true disciple of Jesus because he had so much suffering and weakness in his life. They didn't understand why the message of victory and reconciliation in Jesus would be coming out of the unimpressive lips of a man who so often spoke of his weakness, affliction, sufferings, of being so utterly burdened beyond his strength that he despaired of life itself. That's what Paul says. Paul knew that these things were present so that the power of God would be displayed, not the power of Paul. But the Corinthians struggled to see and understand. Here's what Paul said. 2 Corinthians 6, as he's trying to convince them that he is an apostle of God, a blessed one. He says, we are treated as imposters and yet are true, as unknown and yet well-known, as dying, and behold, we live as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. In return, I speak to you as children, widen your hearts also. The Corinthians struggled to have a category wide enough for sorrow and rejoicing in an already not not yet kingdom where the Savior has come and he's still coming. Paul, he'd learned to always be rejoicing in the Lord while also experiencing sorrow in this life. Similarly, we too might need to widen our hearts. See, sorrow is not the opposite of rejoicing in the Lord. The opposite of rejoicing in the Lord is rejoicing in anything other than the Lord. We cannot serve two masters, Jesus says. We cannot love God the most and love money the most. We can only love one thing the most. But when we love God the most, we can rejoice in what he's done and still experiencing sorrow when he isn't fully present. See, the physical heart has many chambers, and your spiritual heart can hold sorrow and rejoicing at the same time. You've been fearfully and wonderfully made. Don't run away. Widen your hearts. Feel what it feels like when enmity is strong and God seems gone. David is sorrowful in heart all the day long because what he values most, the presence of the Lord is gone from sunrise to sunset. Nothing can supplant this sorrow Because there is no greater love in David's heart. But David knows. David knows there is an end date. Sorrow is not the enemy, but sorrow does have an end date. David cries out, how long? And so should we. See, Jesus, the Savior, he has come. We rejoice. But we're also told multiple times in the New Testament that we are a people still awaiting a Savior. 2 Timothy 4, 1 Corinthians 1, 7, 1 Thessalonians 1, 10, Hebrews 9, 28, James 5, 7, Philippians 3, 20 says, but our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. Indeed, we're given a fuller picture of this in Revelation 21, 1 through 7. We see the new heavens coming down and Jesus saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore but the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. David, Psalm 13, he's longing for the day when the enemy will be crushed and his sorrows tenderly swallowed up in the embrace of his Father in heaven, and so are we. There is a finish line. There is an end date to our sorrows. It's only for a little while that the grief of various trials 
overlaps with our rejoicing, says Peter. It's temporary. It will come to. And so what do we do? What do we do? Romans 8, 18 to 25, it says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. Creation waits, waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies, for in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. What do we do? We groan. We wait. We long. We lament We know what God has said he will do, and we know it isn't reality yet, so we cry out, how long? Just before Psalm 13, before David cries out, Psalm 12, it says, verse 5, Psalm 12, because the poor are now plundered, because the needy groan, I will now arise, says the Lord. I will place him in the safety for which he longs. David is crying out in Psalm 13, how long is now? You said you will now arise. How long is now? Likewise, we hear some of the last words of Jesus in Revelation, the very last chapter of the precious Bible we've been given, Revelation 22, 7. Behold, I am coming soon. Revelation 22.12, behold, I am coming soon. Revelation 22.20, surely I am coming soon. How long is soon? How long is soon? It's been 2,000 years. Do you feel it? God says, I was made to walk with him in the cool of the garden. He says, he's going to dwell with us again, but I live in a house of crumbling bricks with family members who are always sick. How long? O oh Lord, God says the sick will be healed and the dead raised, but we're sick, we're in pain every day, and we're praying and we're still dying. How long, O oh Lord? God says not a hair will fall from my head, but people have hurt me. They've touched me. They've harmed me. I've been wounded. I'm crying, mourning. Sometimes I know why. Sometimes I don't. How long, O oh Lord? How long until you wipe the tears From our eyes. God says he'll give us words to say and faith will come to those who hear. I'm trying to share the gospel. It's hard. I'm trying. I'm praying for my neighbor. And a month later, there's an ambulance out front of her house. And I watch her dying on her front porch from an overdose. I never see her again. She's just gone. It sure seems like the enemy is winning. How long, oh Lord? Talking to a friend, asking what he thinks about God. He says, well, if Jesus rose from the dead, why isn't anything different? Why are people still killing and stealing and lying? And I I tell them some true things, but if I'm honest, that question, it's sticking in my mind. How long until your resurrection power takes root and changes things? How long, O Lord? You say, I have power to repent and forsake my sins. I'm a new creation. I believe I'm trying, but I just keep going back to pornography, to gossip, to substance. I can't stop. Help me, Lord. How long? You say you're going to change hearts to turn to you, but our neighbors are boasting about how they've burst off your bonds and they live however they want to live. I'm compassionately hurting for them. I long for them to taste and see that you are good. But they think I'm a bigot. I can't seem to get any words out of my mouth. How long, O Lord? You say that the church is a light to the world, but pastors are burning out and acting out. They're abusing and neglecting and covering up, and the world doesn't see light. They see hypocrites. This is wrong. How long? You say you're going to repay all the bad things done against me so that my soul is satisfied, but I'm unsatisfied. How long, oh Lord, how long until we have your healing presence that makes all sad things Come untrue. How long until your face lights my eyes? How long, O Lord? We are groaning for you. David doesn't know what to do. And yet he also knows exactly what he's doing. 
Look next, verses 3 and 4, sleep-defying prayer. He says, consider me and answer me. O Lord, my God, light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. He's crying out to God. It's all he can do. If God doesn't answer him, he's going to be overwhelmed by the enemy into death or stumbling astray. The seed of the woman, David, is about to be snuffed out either by physical death of the heir of the Savior or by beating down his soul until he falters and gives in to the darkness, taking his life into his own hands, being king how he thinks he should be king, abandoning the sun that will never rise and becoming a nocturnal, slithering vine like the rest of mankind. Let's consider Saul. Remember Saul? He was the first anointed king of Israel. The story happens in 1 Samuel 13. I'm not going to read it, but I'm just going to tell you the, the armies of the Philistines, they've assembled, and they're like the sands on the seashore. They are exalted and enormous. The Israelite soldiers, they see they're in trouble, so they begin hiding in caves and rocks, even tombs. They're desperately scared. Saul, he's on a hill, and he's supposed to be waiting for Samuel, but he and the people are trembling, and so he does what is right in his eyes, and he offers the sacrifice without Samuel. And right then, Samuel shows up, and Saul, he starts making excuses. He goes, well, I saw, I saw you weren't coming, and, and look how big the enemy is, and I, I forced myself. That's what he says. I forced myself. He acted on his own. Samuel he calls him a fool. He tells him, the kingdom will be taken away from him because he did not follow the command of the Lord in waiting for Samuel. Surrounded by the enemy, Saul thought God was gone, so he trusted in his own strength. He gave in to the enemy's ways. Psalm 14, right after Psalm 13, it says, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. There are none who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. They do not call upon the Lord. See, in our darkest moments, we are tempted to live as if God doesn't exist, to stop praying. That's what happens when we don't pray. We, we live like God doesn't exist. We trust in our own strength. We just got to get to work since God won't. Jonathan Dodson, he, he said it this way. He said, we're in a fix-it culture. If there's something broken, we think, how do we get it healthy? How do we get it back on track? The category of lament is very inefficient. It's unproductive. We hate bad news. We try and minimize it. We want it to be manageable. We love to think things aren't quite as dire as they are. We want to believe we can just tweak our lives here or there. We can just tinker with the church's ministries and programs, and things will all be fixed. But Tremper Longman comments here on Psalm 13, he says the option, according to the psalmist, is either divine help or death. David is no fool. Enmity is strong. God seems gone, but he knows that God still exists, and so he prays. What other choice does he have? David knows he's on the verge of falling asleep at the wheel and shipwrecking God's kingdom. He needs God to arise and revive him, so he prays in his weakness Pray in your weakness. See, David prays in his greatest weakness. He cries out to the Lord. He doesn't hold it in. He doesn't complain to his neighbors. He doesn't get to work. He goes boldly to the throne of grace and to receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Consider me, he says. Look on me. Answer me. Make your face shine on me. A fleeting glance is all I need to know I'm not abandoned. A reflection off the moon would make me know the sun still exists in this night. So come to me. Show up. I can't do it without you and your presence. He's pleading for the reviving presence of the Lord to show up in his life and his heart so his light doesn't go out. He's praying urgently. He's desperate. He's weak. He's praying urgently. It almost feels wrong. But Jesus, he tells us to pray this way too, like the persistent widow in Luke 18. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. 
And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. Adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And then Jesus said, listen to what the un." just judge says and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night will he keep putting them off I tell you says Jesus he will see that they get justice and quickly however when the son of man comes will he find faith on the earth we should pray boldly we should pray urgently and we should pray for the reviving presence of the Lord. David is praying urgently for God himself to enlighten his eyes, to make God's face shine on his, as the Psalms love to say. Jesus also says this. He loves teaching us how to pray. He's got lots of stories. He tells another story in Luke 11 about someone who needs something at midnight, and they knock on their neighbor's door, and the neighbor says, go away. The door's locked. The kids are in bed. I'm not getting up. But Jesus says, even though their relationship as friends won't get the neighbor out of bed, The shameless boldness of the knocker will cause the door to open. And then Jesus says this after that story. He says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead of a fish, or you ask for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If then you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Does David seem a bit audacious in Psalm 13? Bold, shameless, asking for God himself to come to him. Like he has no other options and he's desperate. Well, he is, and Jesus affirms this. He wants you to have no other options but him. He wants you to need him because he alone can give you the greatest gift of all, himself, his spirit. So pray, don't live like he doesn't exist. Go to him. Cry out to him. Ask him to show up. Ask for him. And if he doesn't answer, seek him. And if you find a closed door and it seems like God isn't home, knock. Not once, not twice. Keep knocking until he answers. Where else are you going to go? Keep knocking. I know you're weary. You're leaning against the door, falling asleep. Keep knocking. Because one of these times, the door is going to open and you're going to fall right into his embrace. It might just be the next knock. So don't give up. It might just be next Sunday. It might just be next community group, next prayer meeting, next Tuesday morning, next Wednesday at 3 a.m. when you can't sleep. We don't know when, so don't give up. Keep knocking. Keep praying. Here's why. Verses 5 and 6. We look last. Point 3, Scripture ripens, sing verses 5 and 6. He says, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Now I think David has been trusting God throughout this psalm because lamenting and praying are very trusting actions, but his trust is growing. It's changing it's getting more specific look at the contrast between David and his enemies in verse 4 the foes are going to rejoice if David falters stumbles and rejoicing it's like spinning around the words like going around is this dancing of delight the enemies delighting and trusting in their ability to overpower David they are trusting in their personal strength they're going to dance for delight rejoice when they've been proven the stronger one but unlike them Verse 5, David is not trusting in his personal strength to overpower his enemies. He is trusting in the steadfast love of the Lord. And he will rejoice in the Lord's salvation when the Lord delivers 
David. Now, this steadfast love, it's, it's also familiar language in the Bible. He's not making up some idea that he wants God to be. You might remember if you read gentle and lowly, steadfast love. It's a key word that God uses to describe himself. In key moments, like Exodus 34, 6 and 7, the Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. See, the Lord is abounding in steadfast love. Loving kindness, faithfulness, a loving disposition that never grows weary. The Lord loves to be kind, to be merciful, to be loving to sufferers and sinners who come to him for refuge. It's who he is, and he will not change over time, so it abounds. Like the oxygen in this room, no matter how many people breathe it in, no matter how many times, there will always be more for the next person. So is the Lord's steadfast love for all who trust in him. It doesn't matter how many people in Israel have called upon and claimed and gone all in, taken refuge in the steadfast love of the Lord from the time of Moses to the time of David like a magical tent. It's inside, is always growing big enough, and the host is only growing in delight to serve all the more guests with his accommodations. It's who he is. See, in verse 1, David's already shown his confidence in what God said he would do. He knows what God said he would do. God promised to not forget his people or hide his face as he keeps his covenant promise to bless the people and give them the land and be with them. He knows what God says. But now David is nestling himself not in what God has said he would do, but in who God says he is. Not just what he says he'll do, but what he wants to do. The promise maker is abounding in faithful love. He delights to keep his promises. It's who he is. So David takes refuge. He hides himself right there in who God says he is. And he realizes that unlike verses 1 and 2, he's not sandwiched between the exalted enemy and the absent God. He's hidden himself in God wherever he is. That's where David's heart is. The enemy can rage and taunt and point to God's absence, but cannot ultimately and fully crush David's heart because he has run for refuge in God's character. See, hidden in the steadfast love of God, David is sandwiched not between the exalted enemy and the absence of God. He is sandwiched in between the promised word of God and the fulfilled word of God. See, when God speaks, things happen. They must. He's God. He says, let there be light. And there's light. He says, be healed. And you're healed. He says, Israel be blessed. And Israel will be blessed. It's on the way out of his mouth. It's in the process of becoming reality. And in that cleft, in the spoken rock, David has made his home. He's put out a doormat and a mailbox. He's moving in, living right there in between what God has said he would do and it becoming reality. One side of the lean to is God's given word. The other side is God's fulfilled word. The ground that David can stand on in between is steadfast love, God's never-ending desire to fulfill for those in need. How long will it take? How long will it take? The scoffers are asking. Scoffers Love to scoff. See it in the New Testament, 2 Timothy 3. Scoffers will come in the last day with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where's the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. How long will it take for God's promised word to become God's fulfilled word? How long will it take? I don't know. I don't know. The one I've trusted in to come through for me is gloriously beyond time. How could I even understand if he answered But the ground I stand on is that the Lord is not slow. He's patient, steadfast love. He's not forgotten. He's patient. 
He's desiring all to take refuge in him. Steadfast love. The steadfast love of the Lord is David's foundation to stand between God's spoken word and God's fulfilled word. This is why David can speak of rejoicing even in this moment in Psalm 13 when the enemy is strong and God seems gone. Though the circumstances are dire, his heart can begin tapping its foot to the dance of delight because it's not up to him but up to God to come through. It's up to God to come through, and God loves coming through. So for David, it was never a question of if, but when, and he's fully resting on that now. And so what does he do? He, he resolves to sing. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me, says David. God has given him everything he needs. He has no lack The word for dealt bountifully is elsewhere translated, meaning weaned or ripened, no lack. Everything necessary for flourishing maturity has been supplied by the Lord for David. So what is it? What has God supplied enough of for David to sing when enmity is strong and God seems gone? What has he supplied? Well, surely it could include experiences of God coming through for him in the past. It could include any number of things, who am I to put bounds on what is bountiful, but I want to zoom in on one thing that I know is present, because I think it might even be the main thing. How does David know about the steadfast love of the Lord that he trusts in, and his heart rejoices because of How does he know? It's written down in Exodus. When David asks how long, in, in verse 1, how does he know that God says he won't forget forever or hide his face? It's written down in Deuteronomy. How does he know the enemy will ultimately not prevail over the seed of the woman? Genesis 3 has it written. Genesis, Exodus, Deuteronomy. These are the first five books of the Bible, the Torah called the law. God spoke it to Moses. Moses wrote it down. David read it. David believed it. He meditated on it. He knew it. But if that's not convincing enough, look, there's more. Book one of the Psalter, this is what we're in. This is preaching Psalm 13 fully in the context of book one of the five books of the Psalter in context of the Bible. And in book one, Psalms 3 through 41, remember one and two were an introduction last week, 3 through 41, it contains a lot of suffering. The enemy's strong. God seems gone. There's a lot of crying, a lot of running, a lot of despair. You read 3 through 14, a lot of darkness, crying, tears, crying out to God, but it's centered Book one is centered around a group of psalms highlighting and trusting in the king. If you look at Psalm 15, you look at Psalm 24, they're almost identical. They're talking about who can climb the hill, the pure one, the king. You can look at them later, Psalm 15 and Psalm 24. And then if you move in, like a mountain, is called a chiasm. The, the psalms on either side, so 15 and 24, and then 16 and 23 and 17 and 22, and they move in, and the mountaintop of book one of the Psalter might very well be Psalms 19 And leading into 20, if we stay in Psalm 13 and we tug on a couple of the threads, enlightening the eyes in verse 3. Remember, enlightening the eyes and rejoicing the heart in verse 5. And we follow them and we see them pop up in the heart of book 1, Psalms 19 and 20. It says this in Psalm 19. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the The simple, the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. God's word has been given. It's precious. That's why in Psalm 20 it says, Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving might of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, the power of man. But we trust in the name of the Lord our God. We know he will save. His word has told us what he says he's going to do, and he, his word has told us what he's like. What has God provided everything needed for David to sing on? When enmity is strong and God seems gone, what is it? It's his word. The New Testament refers to the word like spiritual milk, and we can grow up to maturity in it. 
And like a weaned child with its mother, remember, weaned thou bountifully, Psalm 31, David, he can rest in God's apparent absence because he's ingested the word of God enough, growing in maturity by growing a trusting relationship with the Lord. He knows he'll come back. He's been given his word. He trusts him. That's why he sings. And what is singing? Well, remember Buddy the Elf. He said singing is just like talking, except louder and longer and you move your voice up and down. And and he's right. He's not wrong. It's it's not just moving your voice up and down. That's, That's humming, whistling. We don't just sing nonsense, pretending that everything is all right in this world when it's not. We sing words. What words? Words that revive the soul and enlighten the eyes, that rejoice the heart and endure forever. We sing the word of God. No matter where it's at in the process of promise or fulfillment, we sing it. We meditate on it. That's what David is doing. Do you see how David is like the blessed man of Psalm 1? He's delighting in the law of the Lord. He's meditating on it. While the scoffers scoff and the sinners sin and the wicked are inviting him in. But David, David's a mere shadow. He ultimately does falter. He ultimately sins. He does die. And I hope this doesn't spoil the rest of the sermon series for us. But I just can't help myself here. You see, David, he's the shadow Jesus is the substance. Behold Jesus. See him in the garden crying out to God. Not my will, but yours be done. Other plans and sorrow are wrestling in his core. Three times he faithfully pleads with the Lord. Three times he asks his disciples to pray, and three times they can't stay awake. Their spirit is willing, but their flesh is weak. Jesus alone doesn't stumble into sleep. He asks, and he seeks, and he knocks on the door. The cup is in his hand, but no answer from the Lord. The betrayer arrives with his self-serving plan, but Jesus still won't take things into his hands. See him hold back the armies of light while the enemy swells and fights with the light. See him passed through the courts in the night, rulers of men doing right in their eyes. See the Friday morning break, but the sun refusing to participate. See him wait, walking up the hill, the father's silence more deafening still. Will he flinch On the hill, like Saul, save yourself, the taunters call, no. Jesus dies, trusting in the word of the Lord. He is the blessed man of Psalm 1. His roots crack the foundation of Sheol. His branches rise toward the heavens. Blessed are all who take refuge in In him. We want to be the blessed man of Psalm 1. I know we want to. It's good. We want to be constantly meditating on the word and praying. Our spirit is willing. Our flesh is weak. We fail. We falter. We fail at letting the word of Christ dwell in us richly. And we falter when hard times come. And we turn away from God. We slip in to the way of the sinners and scoffers and wicked. But Jesus didn't. He's our champion. We take refuge in him and we're found in him. And where is he now? Where is he now? He's in heaven. That's why we can rejoice in days of sorrow. This life is not the new heavens and new earth. This is not heaven on earth. But we can live hidden in Christ as those who are in heaven while on earth. Widen your hearts. You will feel stretched. You will feel perplexed. But it's not forever. He will return to dwell in our presence. He said so. We live now in him. 
And we find ourselves like David making our home snuggled up right in between God's given word and God's fulfilled word with the very word himself as our foundation. Steadfast love in the flesh is our foundation. We've seen him in the gospels come with healing in his wings, compassion for the weak, comfort for the weary, blessings flow wherever he goes, and he endures the cross for the joy set before him. Now we await our Savior, risen, ascended. We await him to return and make all things new, completing his salvation in which we will never stop rejoicing. Long for him above all other things. He said he will come. It's as good as done. He loves making all things new. So keep singing. Keep singing God's word, God's word, scripture, and Christ. These are the themes of our songs. Keep singing at church, at home, all the time. Sing of his promises. Sing what is to come. It's as good as done. Lastly, look with me at Ephesians 5, 15 through 21. Paul instructs the church. It's us. Look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. They are full of enmity. Therefore, do not be foolish, God exists, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Understand what he said. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. Don't numb out, God still exists. But be filled with the Spirit. Remember, keep knocking. He loves to give the Spirit. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Keep singing. Even in the worst of times. God has dealt bountifully with us. He's given us his word. He's given us his spirit filled in one another. He's given us one another, he says. Sing to one another. He's commanded us to sing to one another. Filled with the spirit, singing his word. He's commanded us to not stop singing. And as we are the church, the congregation of the righteous who've taken refuge in Christ, righteous because we've taken refuge in Christ, we're delighting in the Lord. We will sing on together. Even if you can't open your lips, drag your ears to church. We'll sing it to you. Listen to me. Stop staying home because life is hard and things aren't working out. I agree with you. Come and sing. We're not here singing because life is going great how we want. We're here because we have nowhere else to go. Jesus has the words of eternal life. Let's sing them. Don't neglect meeting together. Don't make it your habit, but come all the more as we see the day approaching so we can encourage one another. Sing to one another. Sing God's word so you'll never forget. Sing God's word to your brothers and sisters so they will never forget. God has dealt bountifully with us. See, when enmity is strong and God seems gone, the word of the Lord lets hope live on. In sorrow-filled longing, there's hope there. In sleep-defying prayer, you're hopeful. In scripture-ripened singing, there's hope. Know what God says in his word. Look honestly at this world and experience the tension. Feel it. Long, groan, and don't give up. Live like God still exists.
cry out to him. Knock on his door. Show up and keep singing. This world can be a dark place, you're right, but hope lives on right here. In the congregation of the blessed, hope lives on. Every reading, every reading says God is still speaking. Every how long says we know this is wrong. Every prayer says God is still there. Every song says hope lives on. So don't despair. Our longings will end when our faith turns to sight. Our prayers will become face to face. But our songs will continue through this dark night and break out in eternal praise. In the land where they need no sun, blessed are all whose hope is God's Son. Let's pray together. God, we give thanks for your bountiful provision. How good are you to us? We have something more precious than gold and sweeter than honey. And we've seen Christ through it in the flesh, your word, flesh. We are trying to trust and rejoice in you now. Help us as we pray. Lighten our eyes. Your spirit and your bride say, come, Lord Jesus. Come quickly. Light our eyes. Our hope is in you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.